Hello everyone and welcome to Wheel Talk Sports first interview with me, Joe Skinner. Today my first guest is power chair footballer Marcus Harrison, who plays for West Bromwich Albion in England. Marcus, how are you doing today? Are you all right? Yeah, yeah, I'm glad I just uh, finished watching the Man City Tottenham game. Are you happy with that result in particular or was it just something you were watching for? I think I'd rather City win to stop Liverpool in the league and we're going to we're going to be competing with Spurs more than City, so... I'd yeah, for anyone who doesn't know, Marcus is a keen Evertonian, but I suppose we'll get onto that a little bit later. But for now, I want to start right back at the beginning as to when you first got involved with and became aware of wheelchair football, if that's all right, mate. Yeah, um, so I started playing when I was like 11. Um, I've started year seven and I went to a butcher tournament with my school. Um, and then someone from another school mentioned um, Paltry football. Um, so I went and gave it a try. And then I've just been playing ever since, really. Yeah, that's all I went through. Yeah, I sort of joined Bolton Bullets with you, didn't I? And that's where we both met. And that's where I saw the ridiculous talent of it on show from Marcus. I say to everybody who I speak to about wheelchair football that Marcus is the best player that I've ever played with. I was sort of a version of a massive vidra, never quite good to step up to the Premier League, but Marcus is a ridiculous talent. But anyway, we'll get on to that a little bit later. I just wondered, for any viewers who are not familiar with power chair football, could you talk to me about the rules of the game and how they differ from other forms of disability sport, please? Um, so, the main rules are, you've got um, a ball, it's four sides, you've got a goalkeeper, generally you have a goalkeeper, a middleman, and then two wingers. Um, there's a rule called a two-on-one, so... If two of your own players are within three meters of each other and the ball is by you, then um, and there's one player from the opposing team, you'll be defending or attacking. That's um, a foul you ever commit to. Um, there's a box, so you're only allowed two players in the box when you're defending. You can have as many as you want attacking, but defending, you only have two. Um, and one of them has to be the goalkeeper. Um, and there's no two-on-one uh, rule for the defending team in the box with a goalkeeper and the defender. Um, and then from, from like set, set pieces, you've got a, the defending team that's got to be five metres away from the ball. Um, yeah, and they're just like the basic rules. My personal favourite, I don't know about you, was always the set ball. I always liked to smash into my opponent, you know, compete a bit. It always ended up with our chairs nearly tipping over in midair. I'm sure that happened to you once at a, a Bolton Bullets tournament at Smithles where your chair skidded on its back wheels. But yeah, yeah, yeah. it's a very interesting and fast-paced game, isn't it? Obviously, from the outside looking in, people might not think the game's physically demanding, but to keep focus for like 40 minutes in a high pressure situation and obviously stay calm must be tough. So I'm just interested to know what strategies you use playing at the highest level to keep obviously focused and calm. Yeah, you know I mean, like, because it's four aside, you can't not always involved. It's yeah. non stop 40 minutes. Uh, whereas, like, if in, a, in a normal game, you can get like a little bit of a, of a breather sometimes. Um, but yeah, like it's quite demanding sometimes, but you just get used to it the more you play, um, experience, yeah, yeah. And to like be in a competitive scenario and be able to play disability sport, obviously, is so empowering for many people like ourselves because, like, taking part in sport can be tough for people like ourselves, as I've said. How does disability sport for you and other people that you know enrich the lives of disabled people like help us? Yeah, I mean, like, for me, it's been, like, great socially. So I've met, like, a lot of people through it. Um, I met, like, one of my best mates, Luke, through it. Um, and loads of other great people. Uh, my friend Rick and um, Chris, John, loads of people like that. 
um, yeah, it's, it's really good. So actually, and then on like a competitive level, it's just good to be able to like play in a team sport. Um, that's pace, and like be able to play at like the very highest level uh, in World Cups, um, European Championships, like stuff like that. Um, and like for everyone that's not at that level, it's kind of got something to like aspire to get to, kind of thing. Um, and aim for so yeah. Yeah, definitely. Obviously, with what's going on in the moment with the pandemic, it put a stop to all sport and all forms of society, really. What would you say, what impact would you say the pandemic has had on the sport itself and the players? Um, so, it comes to a stop still. So I'm still, like, um, just stop completely around March in 2020. Um, and it's kind of only just really started back up the past few months, past two, three months, maybe. Um, so, yeah, it's, it's, just, it's just good to be back. I think, like, a lot of people have struggled, obviously, because they've been in isolation and that. Um, but, yeah, it's good to be back. Socially, football is a massive part of everybody's life, really. And I think, like, with with it coming back, it will make us like, appreciate it a bit more. And it seems as if the media is starting to you know, appreciate disability sport a bit more because obviously the sport returned on a major stage with the Disability Cup. Obviously, your team thankfully won against Aspire, which was which yeah. was good to see. And it was good to see Chris Gordon lifting the trophy on the day. How do you feel like the Disability, disability Cup will impact viewing figures and participation in the sport like, moving forward? Yeah, I mean, like, hopefully it just carries on growing. Growing and growing. Um, it seems to get like a good reaction from people on Twitter. People are really intrigued. It. Um, so, yeah, hopefully we do it next year again and it just gets bigger and bigger. Yeah, I seen from some of the players that they was quite critical of their own performance, but I think you guys have certainly got nothing to be ashamed of and put the sport on the map. Uh, so, well done to you all there. What yeah, other I mean, way? Sorry, one. I mean, like, that game was not the best display of how we can both play. Um, but, I mean, obviously, to people that don't, don't really know much about the sport, it probably looked, it was like a good spectacle. It looked yeah. good. But I think we could, uh, we could, like, we we know as players, like, we could have played better and made it look better. Um, or even better than it was. But when we watched it back, the production of it was, like, brilliant. Um, I didn't play very well myself. I didn't think, but um, the main thing was just the publicity of it and getting it out there to the public. Uh, and I think the production, the way they've done that. I suppose it made you sort of feel what it must be like to be a professional footballer in a way, like a, a day in the life kind of scenario. Like, was mm -hmm. people interviewing you after the game and things like that? And um, I never got interviewed. Personally, but um, Chris and John did. They went. They got interviewed quite a lot. So yeah, it was cool. What other ways do you think the media can influence participation and you know highlight disability sport for people in, in the future to show that we can do these things and we can get involved in sport because obviously with social media and and things it comes in with a bit of for a bit of flack, but it can be a cause for good as well. And um, what other ways do you think it can improve the sport? I think um, on a smaller scale, just trying to get more people involved and making more people aware of it, like more disabled people, but then like on a bigger scale, um, more things like that, like, like the BT uh, Disability Cup, um, more, thing, more things like that, they're great, because like everyone sees what the sport's all about. Um, is a way that it actually exists um, and hopefully like more people get interested in it than what's on TV. Yeah, definitely. On to your, like, on to your strengths in, in your game now, like, what you possess in your game. I always thought you was an excellent dri dribbler. The ball used to stick to your wheelchair guard like glue and nobody could get, get it off you in my personal opinion anyway. But what do you feel the biggest strengths of your game are if, if you do analyse those things? Because I know 
players and people can be our own harshest crit- critics, really. Um, yeah, like definitely dribbling is one of them. Um, like also like just uh, I don't know what the, like the word is, but let me brain kind of thing like thinking quick. Um, like good football brain. Um, and technique definitely the free the free best. Definitely, because having a good football brain like allows you to see what's going to happen like for a few three or four moves down the line, and especially with kicking and things like that as well, because you have to get the angle of the chair right and the approach. I'd imagine, which is something I could never really do, uh, which probably set me apart from the good players really. But can you explain a bit about how what that entails? You know, like kicking and the diff- difficulties behind it. Um, so there's like a lot of things, but getting your chair set so you're ready to receive the ball is a big one. Um, playing in reverse, um, so you can like hit the ball because so you're facing forwards, it's harder to attack your team's goal. Um, and just like tactical knowledge, um, it's like a big thing. Um, but yeah, like. There's, there's lots of different things. Yeah, it's obviously stood you in good stead because you made your England debut in 2014, I read, which must be a real honour for you. Can you talk to me about how the WFA go about the selection process and like where you were w- when you first received your call up and how you felt? Yeah, yeah. So it's it's the it's actually the FA that do it, not the oh, WFA. Right. Um, so um, I think. It was 2013, maybe, um, when I got like a selection to the camp. Um, and then I was fortunate enough to get the call up um, to the, 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 the squad for the European Championships. Um, and I remember they like really well because I played well in the camp, come home. Uh, then the ball slipped. I mean, Gerard slipped. Then the ball scored, and then after the game, I got a phone call saying, uh, "You're going to Limerick to play for England." So I was, yeah, memorable, memorable day. As an Evertonian, I bet you was buzzing that day seeing Gerard yeah. slip up, and then to be rounded off by getting getting a call up for England must have been a special day for you. Yeah, it was a great day. Great day. I'm glad. I'm glad you're hitting the headlines, and hopefully we we can continue to see success uh, with England, which I'll get onto in a moment. But I've noticed as well, the majority of the players who play for England play for the likes of Norman Funder, Aspire and WBA, who are all obviously rivals in the National League. But you all seem to have a really good team spirit, much like the uh, men's setup in the England setup at the moment. What would you say is the secret to this? Um, I suppose, like, it's on the pitch, rivals, but then I'll say, like, we're, like, really good friends. Um, so when we go to England, we're all together then. We're all on the same team. So we're just, like, playing with your mates, kind of thing. Yeah. Two key figures for me, besides yourself, in wheelchair football, that I've always, you know, admired from afar, are the likes of Chris Gordon and John Baldwin. Can you describe to me the influence they have on the England team and what similarities they maybe have with the likes of Harry Kane, for example? Yeah, I like the both like great leaders. Um, like Chris, Chris manages our team, West Brom, and John manages Aspire. Um, and they're like veterans of the sport. They've been in it for like 15 years. I don't know, something like that, maybe longer. Um, so yeah, they they've been around for a while, especially John, um, and they they've been a big part in growing the sport and getting it um, where it is today. Yeah. I read that John started playing the sport with a tire attached to his wheelchair in two thousand and one. Mm-hmm. So clearly, that shows uh, how far the game's come, and hopefully, we see different types of wheelchairs that go even faster. Than, than, than they do now. For anyone who is who, who isn't aware, also the chairs go six point four mile an hour during games, so it can get very interesting, can't it, Marcus? We, we yeah, often yeah. see down the pitch, and 
you know, crash into one another, but it's all good fun. Um, yeah. When you won the European Championships, thankfully, in 2019, one of, one of the people that I saw getting stuck in a lot was John uh, with the France players. Can you talk to me about the rivalry with France, you know, the game itself? Um, yeah, like, so, when I got selected to play in the European Championships in 2014, um, they beat us in the final. I um, can't remember what the score was. Maybe 3-0, 5-0, something like that. Um, and then, in the World Cup, they won it in 2017. Um, but they beat us in the group, 2-1. Um, and then they won that competition. Um, then we we lost the Champions League final to a French team um, the, the year before that as well. So it was, it was nice to get some revenge. Yeah, definitely. I saw a lot of challenges flying in. It was quite amusing me to see that there is still that competitive edge, even though it's power chair football. And, you know, I think John and maybe even yourself on a couple of occasions had to be warned by the referee, so I suppose you can liken it to England, Germany in able-bodied football, that rivalry, mm. considering the amount of time you, you came up against one another. Yeah, I got a yellow card. <laughs> oh yeah, I think I remember that. Was it? You get yellow cards, don't you, for like banging into the front of the bumper too heavily, don't you? Is that, or the wheels? or? Yeah, the wheels, through the ball. Through the, <laughs> the back. That was my face, foul. There's never a yellow card. Oh, yeah, no, we'll, we'll leave that one out. The referee's probably not watching, but <laughs> thankfully, after going 2 no down, you were part of the heroicness that brought England back into the game, scoring two goals in the second half. And then, obviously, we famously went on to win the penalty shootout. Uh, you scored the winning penalty. Historically, England uh, aren't good at penalties, as we've seen in the Euros this summer. But here, we managed to come out on top. Can you talk to me what was can you talk to me about what was going through your head at that precise moment? Um through the game or the penalty? No, sorry, the, when you took the penalty when you took the final penalty and then won it as a result. Uh, so obviously because I'd scored two of the goals, um I was really high in confidence. Um a few months before we lost the penalty shoot though to uh, Norman Funder in the club and I missed my penalty um, so I kind of I learned a lot from that um, missing that um, so I knew what like, I'd done wrong um, so then going up when I was I was lost to take my pen I was lost to take it um, and then I just when I went up I, I was practicing me, me swing just before I went up, um, and I kind of just knew I was going to score. I was like really confident. Um, so, yeah. so it was sort of like putting a few demons to rest for you, missing that penalty. Yeah. People yeah. talk about the when, when when something good happens to them in sport, they just they just know that it's going to go all right. Was that the case for you on on that day? Yeah, yeah. I mean, um, in the Champions League, I scored the winning pen. Um, in the court, the semi final, um, of that as well. So I kind of have experience um, with that as well. But before the game, you kind of dread, dread taking penalties, like the fourth of it, like, like a hate. But then when you're in the moment um, and they don't really get nervous, you kind of just focus on it. Um, you know, you're going to put it. Um, yeah, it's just like it's all mental. I seen the goalkeeper actually came off his line before the he took the penalty. Did that affect you at all, or was that his way of trying to like, get in your head? And um, well, uh, Ed took a penalty which he saved, but that should have been retaken because the goalkeeper can't move early on penalties. So the goalkeeper's meant to move after the ball is took. Um, so when Ed took his penalty. He moved forward early and he saved it. Um, so I fainted my first. I swung, but stopped and fainted it. Um, 
and he moved. And then when he sat back, I took it and he, he delayed, he delayed it a bit and they went in. Luckily, so yeah. It was absolutely brilliant scenes of the celebrations that we saw afterwards, people running onto the pitch, you know, family and supportive friends and things like that. And I imagine it was a special moment for you. Yeah, definitely. Um, I can't really describe like, what it felt like. It was, it was, a, it was, a, it was my feeling. But yeah, it was, yeah, it was great. Uh, it was clear also from watching that game as well that England have a very possession-based style of play. Can you talk to me about that? Because I've read an article in The Guardian in 2013 where Chris's dad, Colin, wanted to, you know, set out an ethos for the squad. Can you talk to me about how that's worked upon in training and the types of drills you do for people who maybe don't know about the sport in that kind of intricacy? Yeah, um, so generally, um, in the past, and still now, generally teams play with a goalkeeper, and the goalkeeper stays back and defends the goal and the front three attack. But um, West Brom aspire a little bit and some other teams, and but England were the first to do it, um, decided to get the goalkeeper involved. So we play with four players now. So the goalkeeper is part of the attack. Um, it's like high risk, high reward. But if you do it right, um, it's not really too risky. Um, but yeah, like, so it's hard to explain, but we play back to the keeper, have two wingers, and then um, a man up top as kind of like a striker. Um, or We'll play as a two. So we're adding one. It's usually John or Chris. They play together. Then you have two wingers. Um, and whatever side the ball, ball is on. One wing will push up. And one winger will come show off. And that's generally how it works. The goalkeeper's role then is sort of like, in modern day football terms, to like maybe help by bypass the press and like draw the team onto onto England then as a, as an example. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, exactly. It's just another man. It's another man attacking, and because he's deeper, it draws it draws players out of position and stuff like that. Away from the sport now, just slightly. I know you yourself have two very supportive parents. Can you describe to me the impact that they've had on your career? Um, yeah, so like, all my life, um, you know, my dad just like, kind of treats me like everyone else. Um, I've got three brothers, three sisters, um, so we're from a big family. And uh, yeah, they just always kind of like treat me the same. Um, so it's never any different to anyone else. Um, and then, obviously, with the football, um, my dad kind of like, has took me everywhere. Uh, me, me and my mother off as well. But like my dad was like, my dad likes football, so that was kind of our thing um, to do together. So my dad would take me to, to Everton when I first started. Then we used to go to Bolton after school. Um, and then eventually West Brom signed me and we started going to West Brom every week. Um, and yeah, we travelled like all over the world a bit. But yeah, definitely, definitely wouldn't be here without them like where I am today. Um, I mean, that way helps fix me chair and everything like that. Um, so yeah. The parents are sort of like the unsung heroes of the operation behind the scenes, though, I would say, and I'm sure you agree. Yeah, definitely. Exactly, yeah. Um, another thing I've noticed about you as well is you, you like to do a lot of travelling. I even read that you've been to a beaver on a couple of occasions. Uh, is that correct? Yeah, I, yeah, yeah, I like travelling, yeah. Um, I've been to Amsterdam, Ibiza, um, Berlin, Paris, uh, Miami. Um, 
and then like a few places for football. I've been to Portugal as well. Um, I had a few holidays lined up, uh, but obviously with COVID, we couldn't go. But yeah, hopefully next year, end of this year, we can start traveling again uh, a lot more. Have you got any funny stories from your travels that can be aired on this channel or off the top of your head? <laughs> Uh, yeah, so when I was in IPF, um, we were in Ocean Beach, and I went out to have someone, um, and I actually bumped into this guy uh, who was on the table next to us, because uh, the girl that I was with asked for uh, a lighter, and he was a scouser, so we got talking, um, and he lived like 10 minutes away from me. Um, and he was with a lad and a girl, they were both sculptors, they lived by me. And then when we got home, um, when we got home, we, we went to the pub, started going out together. Yeah, and like, we're all best friends now. Um, so I've, I've, been to, I've been to Barcelona with them, um, and I've just been to, uh, to London with them as well, um, to a festival. So yeah, like, I met, I met like some of my best friends traveling. Yeah. I imagine wheelchair football and traveling the world with England as well as giving you the confidence to travel outside of football in terms of as well. Yeah, definitely. Because um, I never really thought about traveling or well, did travel. Um, but then when I did a big one, I found out that like I could do it. And it wasn't as hard as like a 40 will be. Um, so, and then, obviously, because of that, I started to, like, travel on my own, away from football. Um, so, yeah, football was, like, help me with that. This has been a really insightful interview, Marcus, and I'm sure people watching have been really inspired by it to see that although we are in wheelchairs, you can still do anything if you put your mind to it. As a final question, what are your ambitions for the future, both in power chair football and beyond? Um, so, Belgium football, um, I want to win the World Cup with England next year, um, that's in Sydney, and I want to win the Champions League with West Brom, um, whenever that is, hopefully that's next year as well, um, but yeah, they're kind of what I want to do. And then, outside of football, I just want to travel more, um, see more of the world. Places. Being the motivated ind individual that I know you are, I'm sure you'll go on to achieve those things and hopefully bring it on for us in, uh, so, is it Sydney in 2022? Have I got that right? Yeah, yeah, in October, I think. Yeah. Well, I speak for everybody, Marcus, to say that we're all behind you when you go out there and thank you very much for joining me in the interview today. Nice one, Joe. Cheers, thank you.